That was a self-reflective question for you, meaning you should have started already. Why is this not moving? Okay, there we go. So uh, Darius, I think you asked, how many people died of cystomyosis? I, I wrote it down. Okay, um, so I'm gonna ask it's about 200,000 deaths per year according to what I have. So 200 million people are affected, but 200,000 deaths per year. Um, you have five more nights to study for the test. As I said, we have a lot to get through. I thought we had accomplished a lot. Um, I was a little ambitious on what we had accomplished. We have 12 more slides and two more days. So we left off on Monday talking about cephalopods. What does cephalopod mean? Cephalo meaning head, pod meaning foot. These are really advanced, complex organisms. Okay, these are the most complex of the mollusks, and they have some different characteristics that we said these are characteristics of mollusks, and they have some exceptions in the cephalopods. Um, these are, I think we talked about their predators, so they grasp their prey with tentacles, and they pull them into their mouth, and they have beaks to bite things. Um, the foot is actually part of their tentacles. 
So they have a foot, it's part of the tentacles and um, they have the X current siphon so that they suck in water and they push it, shoot it out to move themselves along. Some of them do have a shell that's present inside their body, but it's really small. Some of them don't have a shell at all. The chambered nautilus, which is a really interesting organism, has a full shell and swims around and is something you should look up. Um, they do have a closed circulatory system. So we talked about the open circulatory system having a heart and some arteries and sinuses that the heart pumps fluid through the sinuses, the hemolymph. Um, these guys have a full closed system of vessels. So they have blood vessels, hemolymph vessels. I think we still call it hemolymph, even though it's a closed circulatory system. But their blood, no, we still call it blood. So their blood is separate from their body cavity like we have. They also have a very complex brain. Um, they can think really well and solve problems really well. They have pretty well developed sensory organs and they can be gigantic. So squids, the giant squid is like 18 meters long. There's really, really tiny ones and there's really, really gigantic ones. Which ones? Giant squids are rare to find alive. I don't know that we really know how rare they are because of where they live so deep in the ocean. We don't see them very often, but I don't know that we have a good population number on them because of where they live. We don't see them. Yes. So we find them inside sperm whales, which are also, we don't see that much because of where they live in the ocean. But yes, in their stomachs, we find lots of squid. So we're gonna watch a short video, even though it's four minutes long, we're still going to watch it if I can make this white. There we go. So I found my essay here, and I've been working on it for about a week. So now I'm going to show you how I use Grammarly. What would be the topic? How should we have in the corner of the class? After all, we can have lungs, spines, or even a total neck. But what we do have is the ability to solve puzzles, learn through observation, and even use tools, just like some other animals we know. And what makes octopus intelligence so amazing is that it comes from a biological structure completely different from ours. The 200 or so species of octopuses are mollusks belonging to the order Cephalopoda, Greek for head feet. Those heads contain impressively large brains with a brain to body ratio similar to that of other intelligent animals and a complex nervous system with about as many neurons as that of a dog. But instead of being centralized in the brain, these 500 million neurons are spread out in a network of interconnected ganglia organized into three basic structures. The central brain only contains about 10% of the neurons while the two huge optic lobes contain about 30%. The other 60% are in the tentacles, which for humans would be like our arms having minds of their own. This is where things get even more interesting. Vertebrates like us have a rigid skeleton to support our bodies with joints that allow us to move, but not all types of movement are allowed. You can't bend your knee backwards or bend your forearm in the middle, for example. Cephalopods, on the other hand, have no bones at all, allowing them to bend their limbs at any point and in any direction. So shaping their tentacles into any one of the virtually limitless number of possible arrangements is unlike anything we're used to. Consider a simple task like grabbing and eating an apple. The human brain contains a neurological map of our body. When you see the apple, your brain's motor center activates the appropriate muscles allowing you to reach out with your arm, grab it with your hand, bend your elbow joint, and bring it to your mouth. For an octopus, the process is quite different. Rather than a body map, the cephalopod brain has a behavior library. So when an octopus sees food, its brain doesn't activate a specific body part, but rather a behavioral response to grab. As the signal travels through the network, the arm neurons pick up the message and jump into action to command the movement. As soon as the arm touches the food, a muscle activation wave travels all the way through the arm to its base, while the arm sends back another wave from the base to the tip. 
the signals meet halfway between the food and the base of the arm, letting it know to bend at that spot. What all this means is that each of an octopus's eight arms can essentially think for itself. This gives it amazing flexibility and creativity when facing a new situation or problem, whether it's opening a bottle to reach food, escaping through a maze, moving around in a new environment, changing the texture and the color of its skin to blend into the scenery, or even mimicking other creatures to scare away enemies. Cephalopods may have evolved complex brains long before our vertebrate relatives, and octopus intelligence isn't just useful for octopuses. Their radically different nervous system and autonomously thinking appendages have inspired new research in developing flexible robots made of soft materials and studying how intelligence can arise along such a divergent evolutionary path can help us understand more about intelligence and consciousness in general. Who knows what other forms of intelligent life are possible or how they process the world around them. I did put a video on Moodle of an octopus solving some problems. If you have eight minutes of free time, you don't. After the test, when you have eight minutes of free time, you can watch the octopus escape four different escape rooms and solve the problems. They're pretty intense, amazing animals. I knew that some of them are poisonous. I do not know that all of them are poisonous. That's cool. No, they're amazing. And some of them are deadly poisonous. Okay. So we're moving away from mollusks, but staying in the Lophotrochozoans. And we're going to hit the next phylum, which is the annelids. So annelids, the word annelid means little rings. And you're probably familiar with some annelids. What's the common example of an annelid that you might be familiar with? So we're raining today, you might see lots of them. Earthworms are annelids. Okay, so these are true. Coelomates, so they have a true coelom. They have a tube within a tube digestive system. And they get their name little rings because they are segmented. So their bodies are segmented and they have an external layer called a cuticle, but their cuticle is not shed, which is in contrast to something we'll talk about later. So their external layer of their skin, the external layer of their skin, they don't shed it, um, but it's a protective layer for them. They have to live in a moist environment. I'm sorry if you're one of the lots of people in the world that doesn't like moist, the word moist. Some of them are aquatic, um, but some of them live in the soil, obviously, but they have to live where it is damp, and that's because of their gas exchange method. They exchange gas through, anyone know? They don't have a specialized organ. They just use their skin. Diffusion of oxygen in and carbon dioxide out through their skin. And their skin has to stay moist, which is why I can see worms that have crawled out after a rainstorm on the pavement and then not made it back into the ground and dried out. They died probably from suffocation because they couldn't breathe because they didn't have enough moisture. So gas exchanges through their skin. Um, they have segmented bodies, and we'll talk a little bit about their bodies and show you some of their ways they get rid of waste. They're coelomates, so they have a full digestive system, um, mouth to anus. And we'll talk a little bit about the one specifically of the um, earthworms. 
And we'll talk about reproduction with earthworms and that's, they move. That's the other thing. Okay. I'm gonna have to erase this because there's some pictures coming. And someday I'll learn how to do this right. No, I just wanna erase it off. Okay, so it's funny again, as I was looking through this, I was remembering my college days and how things have changed since I was in college. And things have changed even since the last edition of the textbook. We've rearranged the groups within the phylum analyta. So there's two different groups now. Um, again, recently re reorganized. One of the them are the Orantians. Most of these are marine, living in salt water. Some of them live in what we call brackish water. So they live in areas that are Partly salt, partly fresh water. Not as salty as ocean water, but not as fresh as fresh water. Most of these are also highly modal, so they move around a lot. Um, the unique characteristic here of Arantians is that they have a pair of parapodia, a pair of parapodia. And those are just like fleshy protrusions. And at the end, and I forgot to look up how to say this word. I never remember how to say it. Anyone want to come up with a way to say that word? <laughs> Keet, I think it's Keats because they're polychaetes. If it's, they used to be called polychaetes. Back in the day, we used to call them polychaetes. So I think it's Keats or Keete. These are just bristles at the end of these fleshy protrusions. And this is used for locomotion. Yes, so that's, they have these fleshy protrusions with these little bristles on the end, that's how they move. And you'll see this a little bit better on the next group, which are the earthworms that don't have the parapodia, but they have the chitae. That's the Locomotion, locomotion. And I wanna reference a song from the eighties, but I know you won't get that, so. The the Arantians, all of them live in aquatic or damp environments. The Arantians live in mostly marine saltwater environments. The other group within the phylum analyta that we'll talk about are sedentarians, and these are the um, earthworms that we're talking about. We call them sedentarians. It doesn't mean that they don't move. They're not sedentary. They still move. They're just not as modal as a polychaete is or as a Arantian is. Sorry. Again, here's the problem with they've changed things on me. These guys are more burrowing. So this is the earthworms. They burrow down. Um, they live more, they're more terrestrial, but not all of them are terrestrial. So here's an example of a sedentarian that is not terrestrial. That's a Christmas tree worm. They're really cool. There's lots of different colors and they're pretty. Um, they are aquatic. They live in a tube and they have gills and tentacles for feeding. So they don't breathe through their skin, they have gills. So again, an exception to our rules as always. Um, another example of a sedentarian is a leech. Okay, and leeches are not the most glamorous poster children for the sedentarians. Um, they are known for what? Blood sucking, which people, they used to be used in the medical field for um, bloodletting. One of the ideas of how to make people better was to take their blood away, no matter what they were sick from, let's suck some blood out and see what happens. Um, it wasn't always an effective strategy, um, but now we still, leeches are still used in medicine because they actually secrete an anesthetic. So the host doesn't feel when they latch on. And then they also make a um, anti-clotting agent called, hy called hyrudin. And so after surgery, sometimes leeches are used to help keep blood flow moving. Um, and it sounds disgusting, but it's pretty effective and we still use them. Oh, sorry, there's more here. Um, the leeches do have the external sedimentation, you, segmentation, sorry, you can see they do have segments on them. It's just not as obvious maybe as earthworms, which is what we'll talk about next. So earthworms are kind of the typical sedentarian analid that we talk about. Um, you've probably maybe even dissected an earthworm. If you haven't yet dissected an earthworm, we will in lab, not this week, but next week. Um, if, 
I don't know how much time you spend thinking about worms, but if you look at a typical earthworm, a Lumbricus terrestrius, they have 32 segments between their mouth and the clitellum. No matter what size they are, they have 32 segments. You don't need to memorize that number. Um, different species have different numbers. So this is a typical earthworm. And then every segment after the clitellum is identical. So up in, in this first 32 segments, there is some unique, there are some unique elements. Um, but after that clitellum, every segment is exactly the same. And so it grows by just adding on more and more segments that are exactly the same. So in these segments, so we'll look at the back segments first. You can see these guys, the metanephridium, what do you think those are used for? We've used the term before. They're sort of like kidneys. Anytime you see nef, that's sort of like kidneys. So this is getting rid of nitrogenous wastes. So that's how they're getting rid of nitrogenous waste. They have a mouth and an anus for getting rid of other food waste. And there's one, there's one in every segment. Up in the first part, you can see a couple of unique organs. Um, they do have cerebral ganglia. That's their sensory organs. So those are their brain. Again, very primitive kind of brain. They, they're not particularly intelligent, um, but some concentration of nerves there. And then you can see their digestive tract is here in pink. They've got a pharynx, which is the throat, and then they've got a crop and a gizzard. So as food moves through, they're moving through soil, they're taking all the stuff in, so they just, kind of take all the soil in and then they're digesting the food parts of it. The crop is used for storage. So it stores food temporarily in the crop and then the gizzard grinds the food up. So often they take in small stones and things like that that are used kind of like a bird to grind up their food. And then whatever they don't need continues through the intestine. What do you notice wrapped around this digestive tract? They have blood vessels, they have a closed circulatory system. So they get their nutrients in to their body by ingesting them. But as the, they digest them, they're transported through their body through their closed circulatory system. They have blood vessels. So their circulatory system is separate from the rest of their body. They do have um, sexual reproduction, but they are hermaphrodites. So they have both sexes and you'll see this when we dissect worms. Um, usually when they reproduce sexually, it's an exchange of sperm. and it's external fertilization. So they'll come together and exchange sperm and they release the sperm and then a kind of like cocoon forms around the clitellum and it moves down through the body. The eggs are fertilized as the cocoon moves down and then released into the environment. So they're not taking care of their eggs or anything like that. Um, and they hatch out as little teeny worms. They can also reproduce, and maybe you've experienced this in your life, through asexual reproduction, through fragmentation. So if you cut the worm behind the clitellum, it can grow a new, it can become a new worm. No, no, the back part will grow a new worm. This picture that you see here is a giant earthworm in Australia. Okay, we don't see them like that here, but there's a species of earthworm that can get gigantic, like meters long and huge looking like little snakes. Okay, so that gets us through the Lophotrochozoa, we talked about Platyhelminthes, we talked about Rotifera, which is not classified as Rotifera anymore. Ectoprocta, the brachiopods, 
the mollusks and the annelids. Okay, so now we're moving on to a new fun word to say. Yes, I did look up this one multiple times. The ecdysozoans. Ecdysozoans. Yeah, that's spelled wrong in my thing. That's not helping me out here. Okay, so the ecdysozoans are named this because they molt. Is this ecdysozoans on the side? It's a clade. When all else fails, we just say clade. So you're right, it's not a phylum. So we're, they're named this because they shed a tough cuticle, they molt. They molt their cuticle. These are more numerous than all the other ones combined, but it doesn't look like it here. There are eight different phyla of this, we're only focusing on two. So we're gonna talk about nematodes and arthropods. Okay, but this name ectodysozoa comes from the molting of their external cuticle. That was a fast slide, that's good, we need that. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about the phylum nematodes. What are nematodes? What? Do they? I haven't, didn't watch SpongeBob. That could be. They're roundworms. I will look that up because I'm not a SpongeBob. I, I was too old for SpongeBob, I think. I missed that cultural period of life. I can sing the song, but I won't. Okay, so roundworms have no segmentation. So unlike the annelids, they have no segmentation. They do have a full GI tract, alimentary canal, but they don't have a circulatory system. So everything in their body is spread through diffusion. They have fluid in their pseudocelum. Is that what you were? Okay. <laughs> so all their nutrients and gas exchange are diffusing through fluids in their pseudocelum. Some of them are parasitic and some of them aren't. The one that's mentioned here, C. elegans is used in a lot of scientific research for studying things like animal behavior, um, development, aging. So it's, a, it's easy to grow in the lab and a lot of studies have been done on it. Trichinella is a pathogen because we like to focus on the yucky ones. Trichinella causes trichinosis. <laughs> Now I need to erase my writing. I need to switch colors. I don't know what color will work here even. We'll go down below. So trichinella comes from eating undercooked meat and it's usually associated with pork. But I looked it up to try to find a number because I figured somebody's gonna ask me how many people die of it every year. And I was ready this time. Um, Apparently you can get it from undercooked meat like bear even too. So make sure you cook your bear well. It's not contagious for, from human to human, um, but you eat contaminated meat and they get into your intestines. So they reproduce in the intestinal wall, which causes problems like inflammation, um, diarrhea, vomiting. And then they get into the muscles. So once they've reproduced, the juveniles get into the muscles and they form cysts. So you can see these are little juvenile trichinella that have made cysts in the muscle tissue. That causes pain, it hurts. Um, it can cause heart damage, fever, swelling, that kind of thing. 
But according to what I read, it's not that bad. Most people don't die. Um, some people don't even have to get treated for it. They just, their body can fight it off on their own, but there are some anti-parasitic drugs and painkillers that people take um, depending on it, on how bad it is. What I found interesting about this in reading more about it is that the trichinella juveniles actually can help to control gene expression in the muscle cells. Remember that whole central dogma of biology? So they can help regulate gene expression in their hosts so that the muscle cells become more elastic to expand to make more room for them to grow. And I thought that was a little bit creepy. They also have to promote blood, blood um, vessel development so that they can get more nutrients from the blood of their host. But it's not that bad. I remember this from high school, learning about it in high school. I don't know why, but I remember that my study partner and I always talked about, we would say, insist on trying the pigs in China. And that helped us remember that they, there were cysts in pork muscles in trichinella, which kind of looks like it has China in it. That's all I've got for you. Okay, next phylum. And this is a big one. And I don't, we don't even have to get through all of it. We won't get through all of it today, I don't think. No, we won't probably. Okay, the phylum arthropoda. Arthro meaning what? Arthritis is what? Inflammation in the joints. Joints. So this is jointed feet. Really, it's jointed appendages, but photo means feet. So I'm going back to blue for a little bit. So we said that the ectodysozoans have more than any other um, clade. This is the one, okay? This is the big one. This is the most numerous phylum that exists. Um, so far, we've described about 1 million species of arthropods, and we don't think we're done by any stretch of the imagination. People make predictions about how many of the days there are in the world species-wise, and we can't even guess. So we've described about a million species, and there's an estimation, an estimate that we have 10 billion billion, that's 10 to the 18th arthropods on earth, not species, but individual arthropods. So if we counted all the arthropods on earth, 10 billion billion, they outnumber us significantly. They are, if, if they could take us, they would. Um, obviously they have a very successful, they're very successful because there's so many of them, there's so many species. Um, they've evolved in a lot of different ways, um, but we have some general features. They have segmentation, not like a worm has where they have the same thing repeating over and over, but they have three, two to three segments in their body. They have a head, a thorax and an abdomen. And again, because we're talking about an ectodysozoan, they have an exoskeleton, which we didn't really highlight with the nematodes, but they have one too. They have a really hard exoskeleton on the outside of their body. This gives them protection. And it also is a place for their muscles to attach. So they can move. It also provides protection from water. So it's not permeable to water. So that helps them control the amount of water that's in their body, especially if they're aquatic. Again, because they're an ectodysozoan, what do we know about this exoskeleton? What do they have to do with it? They have to molt it. It's not, it's gonna shed. They're gonna shed it as they grow. The exoskeleton doesn't grow. They have to be able to molt that exoskeleton as their body grows. We talked about already that they have jointed appendages. And we'll talk, as we talk about the different classes, we'll talk about the numbers of appendages and how those appendages specialize for different functions. They have pretty well-developed sensory organs. 
So they have eyes, they have a sense of smell. They have olfactory receptors as a sense of smell. They have antenna to be able to touch and smell with. So they are good at getting information about the world around them, which is maybe why there's so many of them. Like mollusks, they have an open circulatory system. So no true blood vessels. They have a heart, they have body sinuses and maybe a few short arteries. No blood, they have hemolymph. So they're, they're moving things throughout their body using um, diffusion through these, the hemolymph. Their exoskeleton, oh, I meant to say this earlier, sorry, <clears throat> is made of protein and chitin. What else has something made of chitin? Fungus have a cell wall made of chitin. To get rid of waste, they use malpighian tubes, which actually branch off their digestive system. We used to dissect um, grasshoppers and see these. We're not doing grasshoppers anymore because they mostly turned out to be motion inside. Um, I don't think we'll see anything clearly in the crayfish. We'll dissect crayfish for this one. Um, and they use sexual reproduction. They have separate sexes, so they're not hermaphrodites and it's usually internal fertilization. And we'll see that some of them have um, specialized appendages for things like delivering sperm. And there's a picture that you can't see anymore because So you can see lots of appendages. Some of them are specialized here for defense. Some are specialized for feeding. Um, we've got antenna for sensory reception. This one has a cephalothorax, which is the head and thorax are fused into one, and then the abdomen. And then there's swimming appendages um, on the bottom there. So this is just kind of a one example. Um, we're gonna talk about two phylum, maybe even three today. Maybe done, we'll see. Okay, so in the phyla, we're going to talk about three major clades, the chelicerates, the myriapods, and the pan crustaceans. Again, this has changed since I was in college and maybe since the last edition of the book even. Um, so subphylum chelicerata, or chelicerates, have six pairs of appendages. So how many is that total? Well, they've got 12 jointed appendages. And they're divided into groups. So they have four pairs that are walking legs. How many is that? Eight. So what are, what are some things that might be chelicerates? They go into the pan crustaceans. What do you know that has eight walking legs? Spiders are kind of the main example that you might be familiar with. They're not the only ones. Um, they have one pair of pedipalps. Um, these are sometimes sensory, sometimes used for reproduction, and sometimes used for predation. Scorpions fall into this, and their pedipalps are pinchers. I think there's a picture in a minute of them. And then they also have one pair of chelicerae, which is where, how they get their name, the chelicerates. Um, those are pinchers or fangs. So spiders have fangs. There's your scorpion. So here's some examples of chelicerates, horseshoe crabs, scorpions, mites, spiders, ticks, all of those fall into the chelicerates. These guys have the fused 
um, head and thorax. So they have a cephalothorax and abdomen, so only two segments. They don't have any antenna. So you don't see any antenna on these. They also have simple eyes. So only one lens per eye, but they might have more than two eyes. Some of them have like eight eyes, but only one lens per eye versus insects, which we'll talk about later, often have compound eyes where they have lots and lots of lenses within one eye. Most of these have what we call book lungs for gas exchange. I don't think there's a, I meant to get a picture of that. There's a picture in your book. Um, they're basically like stacked plates that look kind of like a book. And that's where they do their gas exchange. This is just a picture of a dust mite. I don't know how familiar you are with dust mites. You're spending a lot of time with them, whether you know it or not. Um, they're all over everywhere and they like to eat your dead skin flakes. And then they um, excrete waste. And the enzymes that they use to digest the skin flakes um, as they are excreted with the waste of your skin flakes are what cause people often to be allergic to dust. It's a reaction to the enzymes that they use, that the dust mites use to digest skin flakes. So if you're allergic to dust, you can blame the mites. Spiders, we talked about have chelicerae that are fangs. If you've read Charlotte's Web or ever studied spiders at all, you know they wrap, they wrap their prey up and then they inject poison into them with their fangs that helps to digest them and then they suck up the liquid. Charlotte is vicious. Um, and then they, spiders also, most of them at least have a unique adaptation. They have silk glands in their abdomen so they can spin webs. Um, what's interesting about that is that as soon as a spider is hatched, it knows how to spin a web. Like it's not a learned behavior, it's an instinctive innate behavior that they just know how to do. Um, if you've read Charlotte's Web, you also know that they do protect their eggs. That part is true. Charlotte's spider just don't talk and they don't live words into their webs, but they do protect their eggs. Um, and they will wrap, the males will wrap up prey as a gift to a female to try to woo them. They can also use those abdominal silk glands to make balloons to be carried by the wind. So they can do a lot of different things. Um, horseshoe crabs we sometimes call living fossils because they just haven't changed in millions of years. They're just the same. I don't know if you've ever seen them before. They're just bizarre organisms. Um, we use their blood actually in scientific research to test for um, toxins that are produced by gram negative bacteria. So they're actually really valuable for scientific research and their people, their jobs are to like collect horseshoe crab blood. They go out and get horseshoe crabs and drain them their blood, hopefully enough to not kill them and then let them go again. And that's one of their jobs is to, you can aspire to that as a career is to get blood from horseshoe crabs. Next subphylum, the myriapods, which already tells you what these are, millipedes and centipedes. All of these are terrestrial, so there's no aquatic millipedes. They all live on land. Do a millipedes, do millipedes have a million legs? Do they have a thousand legs? Yeah. No. They probably do in Australia, yes. Everything in Australia, Everything in Australia is, weird. is weird, it's true. I don't even like to think about them. If I had to pick between a millipede and a centipede, I would pick a millipede. Centipedes creep me out. Well, there are some in Australia that have a thousand legs. Um, the difference between a millipede and a centipede. A millipede has two legs, two pairs of legs. 
per segment. So the segments are like fused, two segments are fused together. So they have two pairs of legs per segment. They are heterotrophs. but they're decomposers. So they're helpful in the process of nutrient recycling. So they're eating dead and decaying material and they're pretty slow. Centipedes on the other hand are not. They only have one pair of legs per segment. And they are carnivorous. And they're scary fast. They move fast. They often have poison too. Centipedes can produce poison in their claw. They have these poison claws on their front segment that they can they can be poisonous. Centipedes also have a flat body, and millipedes have a rounded body. Millipedes can almost be cute. Centipedes are just creepy. We will not dissect these in lab, but we have, I think we just have them in um, plastibounce now. We used to have jars of them, but then they started falling apart. Okay, we're gonna start one more. We're gonna get ahead. Okay. So, pan crustaceans, subphylum crustaceans. All kinds of little cute guys here. Okay, so this is a new grouping again. This is a new clade that puts insects and crustaceans together. Not everybody does this. Okay, taxonomy is not a science where everybody agrees all the time. Um, but this is new data suggests that this is maybe how it should be, but we haven't figured out quite the relationships perfectly yet. So crustaceans are things that you're probably familiar with, includes things that you're probably familiar with and some you might not be as familiar with. Um, crabs, obviously. Krill, barnacles, anyone know what this little guy is? To Daphnia, to water flea. They're just cute. Shrimp, these are barnacles. Um, so some things that make them unique is that they have two pairs of antennae. And then also they have biramus appendages. What does that mean, you ask? Because I know you're wondering. So they have this part, which is attached to the body. And then they have these two rami. They are coming off it, rami. And that's unique to the crustaceans. So this is a basal segment, not that it really matters, but. So the basal segments attached to the body and then the two rami come off that. They live in a lot of different environments and they have a lot of different kinds of specialized appendages. Again, we talked about the two pairs of antennae, which are unique. Um, their walking legs are on their thorax, not their abdomen. So, Most of these, when they reproduce, have separate sexes. And they have some kind of specialized appendage for reproduction. So 
Some of these are really, really tiny, like krill and copepods are really tiny organisms that are really important in food chains, ocean food chains. And this does include things also like isopods, pill bugs, potato bugs, roly polies, whatever you call them. There are some terrestrial species. So we'll look at in lab next week, we'll look at my special pill bugs, my dairy cow pill bugs. We came all the way from California for you. Okay, so that's good. We got one extra slide done. On Friday, we're gonna finish this chapter. We'll talk about hexapods and echinoderms, and then we'll be done so. So study, study, study. Thank <laughs> you.